economist Rick Rosso, who's senior fellow of uh, Donning Chair at the India US Policy Studies and Central Studies and International Studies. He just introduced what the, the entire event is and why we're all meeting. And thank you all for being here. Please, Rick. Well, thank you, Didar. It gives me great pleasure to uh, announce the launch of the U.S.-India Innovation Forum. Uh, it's now been approximately one year since the governments first came and asked for the uh, creation of this forum. You know, I think in U.S.-India economic relations, there can be negativity. Um, we're not on the same page in some trade issues. There's liberalization. There's visa issues on our side. But as everybody in this room knows, there's a lot of positive things that are happening too. And many of those positive things are focused on innovation partnerships. So providing an opportunity to get together, to talk about the good things that are happening in innovation, to talk about the other kinds of partnerships that could be forged. So the government thought this would be a great thing to do and a great thing to be led by the private sector rather than this to be created as, a, as another government-to-government -government dialogue. The basic idea that was presented was to, uh, to build together an annual forum, uh, bring in together people that are involved in innovation tie-ups, and uh, let them share their examples, highlight issues that could unlock further innovation partnerships. My first task was pulling together a steering committee. And at the conclusion of today's event, there will be a press release uh, issued that will include the members of the steering committee. Uh, several of them are, are here in attendance today, including Didar, M. R. Rangaswamy from Indiaspora, Sanjay Butnagar from, uh, from Water Health, um, uh, Devon Cocker from IIT Bombay is going to be coming later. Uh, so a great group that we pulled together for a steering committee. The, uh, the interesting thing is when you bring together such a powerful group of innovators too, uh, they weren't satisfied with just pulling together an annual meeting and that be the innovation forum. So uh, they forced me to think uh, a whole lot bigger and to set out a whole bunch of other uh, programs that we'll be doing during the year to actually forge tie-ups in innovation that might not have existed otherwise. So the innovation forum has already grown from what the governments had asked us to do based on three uh, main workflows, each of which is represented by a panel in today's discussion. One, university partnerships. Is there more that can be done for American universities to partner with Indian universities to unlock commercial research opportunities and help students learn how to kick off their own programs, their own companies? The second is, uh, is trying to help develop innovation ecosystems in India. And uh, for there, we've got grand plans. The government of India has announced on developing incubators, and Fiki's been such a great partner of the government on that accelerators, mentorship networks. So finding ways to use this innovation forum as a platform to bring more American partners to try to contribute, but also to use as a channel to help bring uh, top-notch Indian innovators to the United States. We want to make sure that there's value unlocked uh, for innovation for both sides. The third work stream focuses on the role of government. Uh, in the United States, and great to see uh, Nareg Sagarian from the US Small Business Administration came out today uh, from the United States. Um, you know, the United States has actually got some programs where the government has proven to be very effective in targeting funding for small businesses to give them a leg up. Uh, India's got programs like that as well. So can we get together and learn best practices? Uh, certainly worth our while. So these three work streams are going to be a lot of activities happening in between, you know, a big annual meeting on the Innovation Forum. Uh, I'm happy to report that we've uh, already forged uh, the first tangible output of the uh, U.S.-India Innovation Forum. Uh, using the, uh, the, the mentorship network that we're creating on the United States side, and the great program Uber Exchange that, uh, that Uber's launched, and, and Eric will mention that uh, a little bit later, um, we're going to provide mentors for the groups of entrepreneurs that India brings, uh, that, that Uber brings back to the United States. So it's great to see that this is uh, already resulting in kinetic activity. Uh, Uber also has joined uh, Coca-Cola, the Wadwani Foundation, Qualcomm, to help to underwrite and sponsor the, uh, the, the Innovation Forum. Uh, so it's great to have such top-notch innovative companies there as uh, core partners for the Innovation Forum. I'd also like to thank for today's program our partners, the Indus Entrepreneurs and Diaspora and the U.S. India Business Council. Uh, each is represented today by uh, representatives of the organizations, and uh, a lot of you probably heard about this event through, through those groups as well. So thanks again to, to those organizations. Now, looking ahead, we'll host a series of uh, sector-focused innovation events, both in the United States and India going forward, trying to figure out, all right, innovation in agriculture, innovation in healthcare. You take a look at the topics where innovation is most important, and there's great things happening, and learn from folks that are deep in the experience in those areas. What have they learned? What have they done? How can we get more partnerships to be forged? So you're going to see a lot of work coming out of the Innovation Forum after we have this launch event. And the timing is right. Coming on the heels of the Modi government's announcement of its uh, stand-up startup initiative, you can really feel that the idea of innovation and entrepreneurship is, is catching on in a big way in India. So I think uh, finding more American partners to come out here and try to forge partnerships, uh, the time is right. 
Over the next two days, senior leaders of the U.S. and Indian governments will meet for the last strategic and commercial dialogue of the Obama administration. Now, some of you may have heard that back in the United States, we've got this election going on, and uh, you're never exactly sure what's going to result on the other side. Most of the time, governments want to come in and fiddle a little bit with, uh, with bilateral dialogues that happen and, and try to put, carve their own stamp on things. So you know, we can't be sure exactly what the government-to-government -government initiative is going to look like on the other side of the election in the United States. But that's another reason that the governments have asked uh, this innovation forum to be led by the private sector. This will certainly have continuity and stability uh, leading past the election. And hopefully it will be a tool to make sure that whether it's a Clinton administration or a Trump administration, they seek to engage India and that innovation is a key part of that engagement on the other side of the election. So thanks for everybody for coming out today. If you're drawn to this event, I suspect you each have a role to play in our work going forward. So as we have breaks, as you grab my email address and other things, let me know. What is the role that you and your organization is currently playing in U.S. India innovation partnerships? How can we use a platform like this to strengthen it, to find partners, to highlight your good work that you're doing already? So, so think of this as a partner organization, and you're not attendees at an, at an event. Uh, hopefully, you're partners for uh, taking the innovation forum work forward. This event, to me, it's a bit like crowdsourcing. And uh, I'll be up here taking diligent notes as you all tell me the real stuff that's happening. Whereas think tanks sometimes get locked in uh, the ivory towers. So, uh, so for me, this is a good opportunity to learn what the real world looks like in innovation partnerships. So uh, now allow me to hand the floor over to our host today, uh, Dr. Didar Singh, uh, Secretary General of FICI, and also a member of the U.S. India Innovation Forum Steering Committee. Dr. Singh. Thanks, Rick, uh, and thanks really to all of you who have turned up uh, this morning. It's, it's uh, really quite nice to see that without, quote, a government representative in, 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 on the dais, we have uh, enough people actually joining and private sector doing its stuff itself. And I entirely agree with Rick when he says that, uh, yeah, the U.S. Have, has its elections and you never know what happens. But in India, we're a little bit more steady on that, by the way, Rick. <laughs> so uh, we know what's happening, and we, we know that uh, where, where, where we need to go, and it's kind of happening together. In fact, I'll, I'll refer to uh, Prime Minister Modi's visit to the Silicon Valley, where many of you were also present, where he actually touched on this whole idea of, of, of innovation. And that's how it became part of a connect with the, the strategic and commercial dialogue that uh, Rick has just referred to. So even though this is a private sector initiative, the idea is that we would report back to the, the two governments in the sense of, of, the, of the strategic and commercial dialogue, which uh, we all know is something which is extremely important between, between the US and, and India. So I'm very happy to be part of this, which Rick just, just mentioned. But, and, and an organization like FIKI will support it in whatever way, way that we, we can. And certainly, as, as we move ahead on this, we will see a large number of private sector companies, both in the US and in India, actually join hands in making, making things happen in a, in a particular manner. I think many of you may have also have heard that uh, at the same time when, when Prime Minister Modi met with, with uh, President Obama, it was also agreed that the eighth Global Entrepreneurship Summit would be hosted in India next year. So that's going to happen in November in 2017. That's another very big one happening. And, and all of business and all of government will coordinate together. In fact, Niti Aayog has been taking a series of meetings on that. And we're all preparing to make sure that that big event happens. Uh, it's not yet decided where it'll happen. But November next year is when this is going to be uh, uh, some, some large connectivity between the US and, and India. Of course, we all know that the US and India have a very large number of interactions happening at, at all levels, besides the fact of private businesses uh, being there in each other's country for so many years. At last count, the government that, that uh, bodies or government uh, joint commissions or government joint uh, bilateral connects that Rick also referred to, at last count, there were over 60 of them actually happening uh, right now. And uh, in this whole thing, and probably I believe that this particular one that, that we are now uh, inaugurating today, or we are all part of the, of the forum's launch, this is the first really completely private sector driven one. So thanks to you, Rick, and congratulations, I guess, to all of private sector here to actually come together and, and do this. Uh, 
we in in Fiki have been sort of trying to connect and lead this this initiative between the between US and India. I think many of you may be aware that we have already celebrated the 10th year of the DST Lockheed Martin Innovation Growth Program, which was all about innovation, all about startups, and and we've already completed almost 500 young new innovators over these last 10 years with a market value of over $800 million. So that's something which actually happened over the last 10 years. And of course, we run the, the Millennium Alliance program with uh, USAID and with, with Department of Science and Technology in, in Government of India. So that's another very big initiative where uh, the, the two countries have come together and it's already had all, over 60, 62 enterprises and some uh, 15 million US dollars worth of, of activity which has been happening and continues to, to uh, gain strength to strength irrespective of what administrations are and, and how things will happen. And of course, we have this tie up with, with, uh, with Thai in Silicon Valley and we're happy to see some of its members here today. Fiki takes a delegation to Taikon every year. Last count, we had taken 72 innovators to Taikon. So that's part of our job of, of increasing this connectivity and making sure that there's, there's both mentorship as well as finance behind whatever, whatever we can do. And, and coming finally to this uh, forum or, or the, the innovation forum that, that is being launched today, I think I agree entirely with, with Rick that it can't be just an event-based activity. It has to really have it has to have projects, it has to have connectivity between the private businesses on an ongoing level. And of course, government has to fulfill its role of making the ecosystem more conducive to this kind of connectivity. And there are issues there, we, we can't ignore it. There are issues ranging from visa on the one hand, visas or, or, or you know, residency issues on the one hand, right up to the whole question of, of financing and, and actually doing joint, joint projects together. So, we, government will, will support us. We have been separately talking both to the Indian government and the US government, and they are right behind the activity that will happen. But essentially, it will be a private sector-driven collaboration. And, and we are very proud to be able to do that. And as I said, in whatever way Fiki can help with that, we'll always be there to, to make sure that uh, we, we lend our, our, our strength to it. So you know, with these few words, let me again welcome each one of you. As I mentioned, the Ambassador is going to join us uh, very soon, and you'll hear his views also on this. But uh, while we get on with this, uh, Rick, maybe now move to the next stage. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dinner. Well, while we're talking about our private sector credentials and how great and all that kind of stuff, of course, uh, nothing is complete without uh, having the, uh, I think, the, uh, the presence and participation of of some of the government agencies that are really kind of leading on innovation themselves. And uh, in the United States, the Department of Energy certainly uh, figures prominently in that list. Uh, pleased to, uh, to, uh, to welcome up to the, uh, to the platform Dr. Elizabeth Sherwood Randall, who's been serving as the Deputy Secretary of the U.S. Department of Energy since October 2014. In this capacity, she is the Chief Operating Officer, overseeing a workforce of more than 100,000 people at department headquarters, national labs, and sites across the country and at U.S. missions around the world. Spent the majority of her career in public service and her leadership role at Department of, en of Energy uh, it really enables her to work on two major global challenges of our time, uh, ensuring nuclear security and combating climate change. Uh, in India, certainly these issues figure prominently here. Uh, she joined the Obama administration in January of 2009, uh, serving throughout the president's first term as special assistant uh, to the president and senior director for European affairs at the National Security Council. Uh, in uh, 2013, she was appointed a White House coordinator for defense policy, countering weapons of mass destruction and arms control. In this position, she was the President Sherpa for the 2014 Nuclear Security Summit at The Hague. Uh, before joining President Obama's team, uh, Dr. Sherwood Randall worked at Stanford University and Harvard University and at the Council on Foreign Relations. Uh, Dr. Sherwood Randall, uh, welcome up to the lecture and thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm thrilled to be here with you, and thank you, Rick, for the introduction. Uh, it is wonderful to be able to join you for the launch of this innovation forum, which was agreed to at last year's CEO forum. And I uh, wholeheartedly underscore your point that the private sector will have a leading role in innovation, 
and that governments can be catalysts and critical partners in achieving our shared goals. So we want to work in a public-private partnership uh, to advance our shared priorities. I've come to New Delhi today and tomorrow uh, to participate in this strategic and commercial dialogue between our two countries. You know that our Secretary of State and our Commerce Secretary will be here for those important discussions. We will discuss a wide range of topics that include security, climate and energy, science and technology, space, economic and regional cooperation, and finance. These talks represent the central importance of India as a strategic partner to the United States. And energy has become one of the most important strategic pillars of our relationship. And we have a very broad portfolio of cooperation. So I want to just begin my remarks by announcing some news, which is that the Department of Energy is going to post an energy officer from the Department of Energy to our U.S. Embassy in New Delhi in 2017. We have a very few officers placed around the world from the Department of Energy in key countries where we are, we are advancing our clean energy agenda. And so we have decided as a result of the close partnership that we have established with India on this front and the priority that your Prime Minister and our President have placed on our clean energy cooperation that we want to put an energy officer here in New Delhi. So with the agreement of your Ministry of Foreign Affairs and our State Department, we are proceeding to fulfill that commitment. This will, of course, augment the outstanding embassy team that is already here in New Delhi to advance the ambitious goals that were laid out by President Obama and Prime Minister Modi. We will have an officer here with a wealth of knowledge and expertise who will be a tremendous resource in helping us to meet the demands of our growing cooperation. And that cooperation is what I want to speak to you about today. I'll talk about some very important elements of our bilateral energy cooperation, and I will also talk about our work together in multilateral fora, including the clean energy ministerial and mission innovation. And finally, I'll talk about some programs that the Department of Energy uses to support and encourage innovation and the deployment of clean energy technologies in the United States and around the world. Both of our countries are active supporters of innovation. For example, India is working toward the clean and sustainable development of urban areas through your Smart Cities initiative. We are pursuing similar efforts in cities and towns around the United States. And the Startup India initiative is designed to promote entrepreneurship and innovation and create jobs. These individual efforts and others like them, along with our vibrant university systems and business communities, serve as important elements of the ecosystems for our global bilateral cooperation in clean energy. Under the U.S.-India Partnership to Advance Clean Energy Research, or what we call PACE R, we are working together through three current groupings, with a fourth to follow next year to improve solar, biofuels, and building efficiency technologies. In January 2015, President Obama and Prime Minister Modi extended the original five-year $100 million program for another five years. They also agreed to expand its scope to include research on smart grids and energy storage technologies. And on August 9th, we officially launched that fourth track of our research cooperation. Through PACE-R and its parent program, the Partnership to Advance Clean Energy, or PACE, our scientists are sharing their expertise to deliver benefits to both of our countries. And we're already seeing important results. For example, the Solar Energy Research Institute for India and the United States, or what we call Sirius, is a U.S.-India research consortium funded under PACE-R and co-led by the Indian Institute for Science, Bangalore, and DOE's National Renewable Energy Laboratory. We have the director of that laboratory, Martin Keller, here with us today. Martin, thank you for joining us. Among other activities, we cooperate on innovative solar research and provide modeling for researchers. 
Serious researchers have produced more than 100 journal articles and conference papers and four invention disclosures, two in the United States and two in India, that could lead to patents. And most recently, PACE R funding for biofuels, advanced biofuels research, has led to a breakthrough in the breeding of sorghum, a biofuel crop. Researchers have identified areas of the plant's genome that provide resistance to a type of persistent disease that thrives in humid and hot conditions. This discovery could lead to cheaper and more sustainable production of sorghum and decrease the costs of products, including biofuels. Our partnership and India's growing leadership on the world stage is crucial to our fight against the looming threat of climate change and our ability to provide clean, reliable, and affordable energy to our people. India is leading the way in developing creative and cost-effective solutions to decrease emissions around the world. For example, the Clean Energy Ministerial brings together the world's major clean energy players to discuss the clean energy policies and commit to actions that will help us to meet our global climate commitments. India and the United States co-lead several clean energy ministerial programs, including the Super Efficient Equipment and Appliance Deployment Initiative, dedicated to advancing energy efficiency standards for household appliances, such as fans, televisions, and lighting. And India's domestic program to deploy 770 million LED bulbs and 35 million energy efficient street lights over three years was an inspiration to the Clean Energy Ministerial's Global Lighting Challenge. This initiative, which was launched in Paris last year, promotes the rapid adoption of energy efficient lighting around the world, including LEDs. We're working toward a global goal of deploying 110 billion high efficiency bulbs and saving $120 billion in electricity bills globally. But deploying more energy efficient technologies is only part of the solution. If we want to meet our climate and clean energy goals, we must accelerate the pace of clean energy innovation that will bring us the energy sources and technologies in the future that we will need. So President Obama, Prime Minister Modi, and 18 other world leaders launched mission innovation on the first day of the climate talks in Paris last year. The partner countries, plus the European Union, which joined in June, have each committed to doubling, global, doubling their government investments in clean energy research and development over the next five years. At the inaugural Mission Innovation Ministerial, which took place in San Francisco in June, members set the group's aggregated baseline for investment. This is currently $15 billion per year among the 21 mission innovation partners. Together, we have committed to work to doubling that funding for clean energy R&D to $30 billion by 2021. This already substantial baseline demonstrates that we have been thinking creatively about how to meet these global challenges for some time. Partners account for more than 80% of current global governmental support for clean energy R&D. And so the dramatic increase in investment that we have each committed to making will lead to a huge expansion of the innovation pipeline. It will also lead to new technologies that reduce carbon emissions, enhance energy security, create opportunities for businesses in a global growing marketplace and help provide affordable, clean energy to consumers. India has been a leader in mission innovation from the start, and indeed I have to let you know that Prime Minister Modi came up with the name of mission innovation. India also serves on the Mission Innovation Steering Committee and works with other partners to develop opportunities to cooperate with clean energy investors and companies. All of this cooperation, both our bilateral cooperation and our multilateral cooperation, will enable us to meet the ambitious goals of the Paris Climate Agreement. The challenge lies in implementing these targets and delivering the desired results. And that is why healthy innovation ecosystems in both of our countries, including strong local and regional cooperation and private sector investment, are crucial. 
Fora like this one are a great way to help us to think about how to strengthen networks, improve cooperation, and better support domestic innovation. In fact, Secretary Moniz and I, the Secretary of Energy in the United States and I, have spent time traveling this year to events much like this one all around the United States to speak about the importance of strengthening regional innovation partnerships. Like India, the United States is a large country with an extraordinary diversity in energy demands and resources. A one-size-fits-all approach to innovation and clean energy is not our most effective course of action. We recognize that what works in California or Arizona may not be what's right for states like Tennessee or Carolina. And so we know that the challenges we face will require, in part, local solutions that fit the energy ecosystems in each region of the United States and take advantage of their respective strengths. As part of the United States' commitment to mission innovation, we have requested $110 million in funding for up to 10 regional clean energy innovation partnerships to be placed around our country. The objective of these partnerships would be to bring together regional innovation players, including research universities, state and local governments, businesses, industry, and private investors to generate portfolios tailored around regional and state needs. Planning, priority setting, and research and development would be regionally led so clean energy programs could be more closely integrated with state and local economic development programs and take advantage of the capabilities in each region. For example, we recently pooled the strengths of the Department of Energy's Oak Ridge National Laboratory, the University of Tennessee, the City of Chattanooga's Electric Power Board, General Electric, and other partners. Working together, they designed and built a prototype in which a 3D printed hybrid electric vehicle connects to a 3D printed building that can produce and store energy. The vehicle's engine can provide complementary power to the building, allowing the house to go off grid during power failures. This creative and integrated approach to power generation, storage, and use addresses electricity supply and reliability challenges. Partnerships like these provide opportunities for innovators in cities, states, and regions to think about what more needs to be done to expand and accelerate innovation and commercialization locally and to develop solutions that best meet their needs. And let me pause right now and welcome our ambassador, Ambassador Verma. We're honored to have you here. Now, let me just say that this, of course, doesn't mean that there's no role for the national government. Of course, the national government has a significant role to play. We're well placed to work with partners to encourage and support the development and delivery of clean energy technologies. And at the Department of Energy in the United States, part of our mission is to do just that. We see ourselves as the solutions people. And I'm proud to say that we have come up with some amazing solutions across every part of the innovation chain, from fundamental and applied science to the development, demonstration, and deployment. We are doing what we can to support innovation in clean energy technologies. Our network of 17 national laboratories conducts significant basic energy and energy-related research. DOE's researchers are conducting research in everything from plasma physics and neutrino oscillations to computational modeling of complex systems and nuclear physics, some of which we do with Indian partners. We also support fundamental and applied research that will advance our knowledge of battery technology, solar, wind, advanced manufacturing, advanced materials, and electric vehicles. But we also are working to make the practical application of our discoveries easier. One of DOE's roles is in helping early stage technologies, including those generated at our national labs, get through the so-called valley of death and into the marketplace more quickly. For example, our Advanced Research Projects Agency Energy, or ARPA-E, funds transformational energy projects before private sector investment is a realistic possibility. 
these technologies have a higher ratio of risk to reward than many other investments. So we're working to get them to a point where they can be more attractive to private investors. In less than a decade, we've invested approximately $1.3 billion in more than 475 projects at ARPA-E. 36 of these projects went on to form companies. 60 have partnered with other U.S. government agencies for further development. <clears throat> and 45 have received an additional $1.25 billion in follow-on funding. For example, Fluidic Energy received a $3 million investment from ARPA-E in 2010 to develop a rechargeable metal air battery system for energy storage <clears throat> at the grid level. As of September 2015, thank you, Fluidic had raised approximately $150 million in private sector capital and installed more than 50,000 battery cells, primarily in Southeast Asia and in Latin America. And the company recently signed an agreement to provide batteries for renewable energy mini-grids in Madagascar, where they will help provide reliable electricity to rural villages. So technology transfer and lab to market activities are a priority at DOE. And we have a range of programs and initiatives and competitions that help us to break down the technological and financial barriers to bringing new technologies, including those developed in our labs, to market to meet our urgent climate goals. We've cultivated an innovation ecosystem at DOE that encourages labs and programs to get creative in pushing more federally funded R&D into the market. For example, our small business voucher program is a great example of how several of DOE's national labs are working to get this done. According to the U.S. Small Business Administration's Office of Advocacy, small businesses develop innovative technology and produce more than 15 times as many patents per employee as larger firms. And the pilot helps small, our pilot project helps small businesses speed next generation clean energy technologies to the market by providing them with easy and affordable access to the expertise of our laboratories and the tools they need. To date, approximately $15 million in vouchers have been awarded to 76 businesses. Further along the innovation chain, our Loan Programs Office works to accelerate the deployment of clean energy projects and technologies at the commercial and utility scale. LPO, as we call it, provides loan guarantees or direct loans to eligible projects and manufacturers, and it is managing a portfolio of more than $30 billion and has led to having a real impact on the U.S. energy landscape. And I want to describe one example to you that has significant relevance to India, given the ambitious goals Prime Minister Modi has set for solar deployment. Six years ago, there were no utility-scale PV generation facilities larger than 100 megawatts in the United States. LPO helped to finance the first five utility-scale PV projects, providing $4.6 billion in loan guarantees and transforming our solar industry. Since then, the private sector has stepped in and financed 28 utility-scale PV product, projects, adding 5,300 megawatts of solar energy to the U.S. grid. And again, that's just in the last few years. According to the Solar Energy Industries Association, that's enough to power 870,000 American homes. Loans to Ford, Nissan, and Tesla Motors have supported the production of fuel-efficient and advanced vehicles. And there are many other examples. If you go to our website and look at LPO, you can see a number of the very exciting ventures that they have supported. Finally, we recently launched the Clean Energy Investment Center. The Clean Energy Investment Center was formed to encourage private sector investment in clean energy technologies and to accelerate their deployment. Through discussion with investors, like some of you here today, we learned that one of the biggest barriers to investment in clean energy technologies is simply a lack of information about what is happening in the R&D space. So the center has been established to make information about our work on energy technologies more readily available to potential investors. 
it will provide a clearer picture of available opportunities, and it will make additional connections to U.S. government programs. The center will address, challenge, address challenges to investing in clean energy and create more favorable conditions for investors. We recognize this is crucial because the private sector will play an increasingly important role in delivering new technologies to markets. Private investors, investment firms, businesses, universities, and industry will be needed to further develop the new technologies that will come from our increased investments in mission innovation. Government clearly doesn't have all the answers, and that's why we're working so hard to make it easier for investors to identify worthwhile opportunities. Our countries and the world need the creativity, and if, if you will excuse the pun, the energy of our people to bring about the changes that will ensure that our people have access to clean, reliable, affordable, and secure energy. So in closing, I'd like to leave you with a final thought. India has a very special place in my heart, and it shaped my family's life even before I was born. In 1953, my parents were married, and my father had just graduated from Harvard Law School. He received a prize upon his graduation called a Sheldon Traveling Fellowship, which enabled him and my mother as newlyweds to spend a significant part of the first year of their marriage living and traveling in India together. Inspired by Indian independence and by what Prime Minister Modi told the joint session of Congress was the impact of the U.S. Constitution on Dr. Ambedkar the drafter of the Indian Constitution. My father decided that he wanted to come from Harvard Law School to study the emerging legal system in India during their time here. During that time, they formed lifelong friendships, and those friendships shaped my world as a child. My brother and I were taken out of school when we were young, when we were 8 and 13, to spend 10 years traveling throughout India. And more recently, my husband and I brought our own two young sons to India to pass along that connection to the next generation. So it's with great pleasure that I have the privilege of speaking with you today about what we and what our next generation can do together to strengthen the bonds between our two great democracies so that the future of our children is one of opportunity and promise. Thank you again for giving me the opportunity to speak with you today. And I look forward to continuing our cooperation far into the future. <laughs> and with approximately 80% of the U.S. federal government in New Delhi right now, uh, <laughs> Ambassador Verma running between so many appointments, I'll keep his uh, introduction short since he's far more famous than I am, so it's awkward to even try to introduce somebody that's done as many things and been as many places. Uh, serving as the 25th ambassador to India from the United States, nominated by President Obama in September 2014 and confirmed uh, just after. Uh, previously Assistant Secretary of State for Legislative Affairs, where he led the State Department's efforts on Capitol Hill. Um, also working in the uh, Senate for many years uh, as the uh, Senior National Security Advisor to the Senate Majority Leader. Uh, time in the private sector as well. And so uh, his time with, uh, with law firm, working for think tanks uh, and, and involvement with so many other organizations in Washington, D.C. has become an institution and it's been a real pleasure to, uh, to get to know him throughout these many avatars and have him as our primary representative in, uh, in New Delhi. So Ambassador Verma, let me welcome you to the lectern, sir.
Well, thank you so much. It's great to be back here uh, at Vicky. I feel like I spend a lot of my time here in this, uh, in this auditorium, uh, but it's really actually a very special day. It's uh, an honor to be here with my friend, uh, the Deputy Secretary of Energy, Liz Sherwood Randall, who uh, we actually started working together in the Senate in the uh, kind of mid-2000s when I was there working for Senator Reid as a uh, Senior National Security Advisor to Senator Reid. We used to bring in outside experts all the time to talk to us, steer us on the right course, and, and Liz was, was one of those people. Uh, Vicki, thank you so much, and Dr. Singh for all your leadership. Uh, proud to be here with representatives from Uber. And Rick, uh, let me just say, there's no one uh, in Washington who understands uh, India, what's happening in the U.S.-India relationship, what's happening at a sub-national level, uh, Rick's weekly uh, publication on what's happening in the States is, is really incredible. And you bring so many insights and, and you've really delivered so much to this relationship. Thank you uh, for your leadership and to CSIS uh, as well. Uh, I want to say, uh, like, like Liz, obviously we're, we're shaped by our uh, parents' uh, experiences. Uh, I'm obviously uh, shaped by my own uh, family's connections here in India, and this has been a great both professional opportunity for me, but also a great uh, personal uh, opportunity for me to come back to the, the land that my uh, parents, uh, my brother, my three sisters were born in. My, my dad emigrated uh, to the United States in 1963. Uh, tells a great and classic immigrant story about showing up in New York City with $14 and a, uh, and a bus ticket um, and essentially started over. Uh, my mom and uh, grandmother settled in, in Punjab after the partition in 1947. Uh, they started over. So there's a lot of uh, great stories of, of resilience and, uh, and courage and fortitude. And uh, my dad never let us forget those roots growing up, I will tell you that. Um, no matter uh, who we met uh, anywhere in the United States, actually anywhere in the world, any Indian person, he would always find some connection to that person. And he would, he would always remind me, he said, we, I went to the same school as that person. I went to this, I'm, we're from the same town. We're from the same village. Your sister's auntie's best friend, cousin, is her, <laughs> is her best friend. And uh, it never uh, ceased to amaze me how he could take a country of 1.2 billion people and shrink it down to uh, a few hundred. I'll just tell you a, a quick funny story. If you fast forward to uh, 2009 when I was serving as Assistant Secretary of State and I got a call from the White House asking if I could come down and greet uh, then Prime Minister Singh for the arrival ceremony at the White House, which was very exciting. So I, I called my dad. I said, Dad, I've been invited to the White House to greet the Prime Minister of India. You're not going to believe this. He said, that's great, son. You make sure you tell the Prime Minister we're from the same place. <laughs> <laughs> I said, you know, I, I can't do that. I can't lie to the sitting Prime Minister of India. That's not a, a, wouldn't be a, wouldn't be a good thing. He calls me the next morning. He said, you make sure you tell the Prime Minister we're, we're from the same town, we're from the same place. I said, Dad, no. He calls me the morning of the ceremony. I said, no, I can't do that. So I get down to the White House, and uh, there's about 12 of us in the receiving line. We're, we're going through the line to, to greet the Prime Minister, and the President sees me there, and I knew him from the Senate. The President says, Mr. Prime Minister, this is Rich Verma. He's the Assistant Secretary of State. The Prime Minister pauses, and he looks at me. He's looking at me from head to toe. He said, your family is Indian. <laughs> I said, yes, uh, Mr. Prime Minister, my, my family is Indian. He then asks, he said, where's your father from? <laughs> I said, my father is from uh, Jalandhar in the state of Punjab. Prime Minister turns to the president. He said, his father and I are from the same place. <laughs> So I, I don't know what the lesson of that story is other than your parents are always right. Um, but we are an uh, exceptionally small uh, country and a ton of close relationships. And the impact that um, 
people from this region have had in the United States. I see our, our good friends here who have been such uh, trendsetters and uh, really done amazing things to bring our two countries closer together. I will just um, say it has been quite a summer and now quite a week in, uh, in U.S.-India uh, ties. We had the Prime Minister uh, visit to Washington uh, with the President speaking to Congress. This was their third summit and their seventh meeting in two years. Now, there are some of my colleagues uh, in other embassies that go their entire tour without a single summit. We've had three summits and seven meetings. And that visit generated a lot of excitement, and frankly, it generated a lot of work, which is a, which is a good thing. We made uh, very good progress on our our landmark civil nuclear cooperation deal to go forward with six Westinghouse reactors. We elevated India's status uh, in the defense trade and defense area to major defense partners, something we don't have with any other country in the world. So we will be treating India as, a, as one of our closest allies and partners for the purposes of defense trade. Uh, we launched uh, three, four, five new clean energy and finance programs, depending on how you count them. They are multi-agency, Department of Energy taking uh, the lead on our clean energy finance, but USAID, uh, State Department doing amazing work in the clean energy area. We uh, signed on to a new cyber uh, framework agreement, which we hope to sign shortly. We, uh, on our security front, we finally agreed to share very sensitive and important information uh, related to terrorist screening. So before I, uh, before I went out uh, to Washington, I sat with the Home Minister and we signed a very important document that would give India uh, access to a, a terror database of people that we're tracking uh, very carefully. Uh, we renewed our commitment uh, to global health security. We renewed our commitment to the fight against TB and malaria. Uh, we're doing so much, so much in, in development, not only here in India, but in 19 countries around the world, the U.S. and India working together. We even established, uh, we even established an agreement to open new consulates. Uh, India is going to open a new consulate in Seattle, and one day when we find the budget authority, we are going to open a new consulate uh, uh, here in India. And that leads us to this week. We not only have our, uh, all the sets of meetings happening here, but we have the Indian Minister of Defense in Washington today. Today. Uh, and we would expect to sign uh, the long-awaited uh, logistics agreement today. And in addition to all our guests here, we have Secretary of Commerce Pritzker, Secretary Kerry, uh, and so many other high-level visitors uh, from Washington, and we hope that the President and Prime Minister will see each other next week at the G20 and East Asia Summit. So there is a lot happening. Uh, it is a good problem to have that there is more happening uh, than less. Let me just say a word about the uh, Strategic and Commercial Dialogue, which was first launched in 2009. Uh, but the commercial track was only added last year. And we don't do this kind of comprehensive dialogue with many other countries in the world. In fact, I can count on one hand the number of countries we do this kind of uh, far-reaching dialogue. I, re I remember Secretary of State turning to me last year during the U.S.-India strategic dialogue saying, we, do, we now do more with India on a government-to-government -government basis than with any other country in the world. And I can tell you, having to receive the high-level visitors from Washington and having to send teams uh, to Washington, we have 40 government-to-government -government dialogues at the assistant secretary level or higher, 40 dialogues. We have 70 different initiatives that came out of the summit uh, last year. We had 52 initiatives that came out of the summit uh, this year. So it, like I said, this is, this is really significant. Now, some of you may say, well, what is this all leading to? Has this actually uh, generated anything productive on the ground? Well, I will tell you, we have broken every record that we keep in every category. Let me give you a couple examples. Uh, the highest two-way trade numbers ever between our two countries were last year at 109 billion. The highest defense trade numbers were reached last year, now north of 15 billion. We even did $6 billion cumulatively in agriculture trade. 
The United States is India's largest trading partner. We've completed massive deals in the private sector, in locomotives, in attack helicopters, nuclear power, as I mentioned, with most of those, most of that activity actually taking place here. So GE that won the locomotive proposal is investing $200 million in the state of Bihar to actually uh, build a, a big section of the locomotives there. Uh, Boeing will build uh, sections of the Apache, the most advanced uh, military helicopter in the world. They'll build it right here uh, in India. And some of you may already know that we actually build parts of the President's helicopter here uh, in India. And during the Prime Minister's visit, we announced tens of billions in new investments uh, here in India in the, from the private sector. And Indian companies are now employing tens of thousands of U.S. workers. Great success story with Indian companies in the United States. It is a good story. We can do uh, better. But I will say that the reforms on the Indian side have certainly helped. We just left a meeting with the finance minister. And obviously, the, the kind of landmark reform on GST was exceptionally welcome. But there have been other uh, reforms taken that have been uh, very impactful. The bankruptcy bill, the new IP policy was a step in the right direction. Something that was somewhat um, quietly implemented, the establishment of commercial courts and a separate court just to deal with uh, commercial and contract disputes and IP disputes. The liberalization of FDI in, in key sectors like aviation, defense, coal, banking, uh, insurance. That's at all at the central level. Now, um, now, I've traveled to 21 states as well, and what I've seen in the course of my travels is this wonderful competitive federalism taking place at the state level, where we've seen these single licensing windows, we've seen uh, making streamlined land available, better infrastructure, and this competition between the states, as, as Rick probably knows better than anyone, has been a real race to the top. When we have companies come in to see us, they're oftentimes carrying the state rankings with them. And they're saying, we're about to go to these three or four states. What do you think? And uh, that's a great uh, competition. That's a great sense of, uh, of transparency. And so we're very, we're very excited. And we really do believe the best is yet to come. Uh, why do we believe that? India is currently the world's fastest growing economy. In 2030, which is not that far away, it will be the world's most populous country. It will have the third largest economy. It will have the largest middle class. It will have the largest number of college graduates. It will have the largest number of patent holders. It will have the most mega cities, those cities over 10 million people. Two thirds of the population is under the age of 35. And there will be a massive investment in Indian infrastructure. It's a commonly cited statistic, but two thirds of the India of 2030 is yet to be built. Think about that. Two thirds of the India of 2030 is yet to be built. So we are quite optimistic. We are quite excited. We support strongly India's rise on the global scene and uh, across the board, politically, militarily, and economically. Now, the subject that brings you all here today, innovation and entrepreneurship, is a important and critical piece of this economic story. And it is the piece that can help jumpstart new industries. It is the piece that can leapfrog over long cycles of development. And it taps into that spirit of innovation that exists here in India and obviously now exists uh, in Silicon Valley. I think the number is 15% at least of startups in Silicon Valley are run by or have been initiated by uh, people of South Asian and Indian origin. I don't think that's just a coincidence. I think there is a real spirit of innovation and entrepreneurship that, that drives our two uh, countries together. I was there uh, in Silicon Valley last year when the prime minister went, and he basically kind of, it was a call to action for all those people there to say that we can't afford a normal path of development. We don't have the time. We don't have the luxury of waiting. We need our best minds to come together. We need our best uh, entrepreneurs and innovators to come together and, and find those disruptive, those new technologies, those new ways of doing business that can actually 
make people's lives better, healthier, safer, smarter cities, cleaner cities, uh, better living environments, uh, in health, in so many areas. And that's what this focus on innovation and entrepreneurship uh, is all about. Now, what will it take? Uh, it, will, it will take continued reforms on the policy side, stronger intellectual property framework. I mentioned the uh, IP policy, uh, which was helpful, but, but you know, when I hear about IPR, everyone thinks it's US companies complaining about IPR. If you go to a room full of Indian innovators, they will, one of their first two or three issues will be, we need a better IPR environment here in India for us to protect our, uh, whether, whether you're an author or whether you're a scientist, you want a better, or a Bollywood film star, you want a better IPR environment. And so I, I hope that kind of policy enhancement and regulatory streamlining continues. But we also need a change in business culture. And this obviously took a, a while for our country to come to this view where dissenting opinions in business were encouraged, where there was great incentives for experimentation and risk taking and failure. We need a business regime and a business climate that actually supports failure. You think about uh, the number of people in our uh, society from Steve Jobs, uh, Bill Gates, and others who, were, who failed, who were fired from their jobs and came back to be able to lead some of the biggest and most important companies. Now, not everyone is going to be uh, Steve Jobs or Bill Gates, but you do need that, that sense that it's OK. It's OK if I actually fall this time. And a policy reform, for example, like the bankruptcy code goes uh, well in hand with this so that you can get back up off of your feet and, and try again. Also need um, financing availability. And I think you'll probably touch on this today. And, and financing comes from all different sources. Uh, uh, government comes in large and small amounts. I will say that one of the interesting meetings the Minister of Defense will take tomorrow will be to go to DARPA which is our advanced research agency that actually does identify innovative and exciting ventures in the defense space, puts seed money in, and we've had some of our best innovations come out of DARPA. So hopefully in the defense space, we can start seeing some of that here as well. And the, and the private sector obviously is coming to the table uh, in India, but it will take an investment climate that investors want to come into. And I know that's what the Prime Minister is working on. I know that that's what all the ease of doing business uh, improvements and enhancements are about. But ultimately, the financing is going to come. Most of it will come from the private sector. Obviously, education and university-led research is a big part of stimulating innovation, uh, where in the university setting, you have the freedom to experiment and innovate. I know you've got a, a panel discussion on that today, which is really important. Finally, I'd just say um, that we need to support our young people uh, and encourage them across genders, not just having male-dominated STEM fields and, and ma men dominating the IITs of India, but greater gender parity in order to stimulate innovation and entrepreneurship. Uh, greater uh, opportunity across the economic spectrum. This shouldn't just be the opportunity for the well-off. We've got to be able to reach out to all those talented people in both of our countries across the economic uh, pyramid. So you might ask, well, what are we doing between the US and India to try to stimulate this? We've got so many programs on innovation. I've probably spoken about innovation entrepreneurship more than any other subject in the past year. But I'll just mention a couple examples. We have our Pace Setter Fund, uh, which uh, is meant to identify entrepreneurs and innovators in off-grid clean energy technologies. We have uh, made our first round of awards this year. I'd encourage all of you to go to uh, look up Pace Setter Fund. Uh, it, just Google it, and you'll see we're taking applications now for the next round of, of awards. And it's been very exciting. We've in fact, one of the projects we just awarded 
uh, was clean cook stoves that were powered by solar, uh, solar energy. And that was a small grant that helps them be able to roll this out to a greater scale. The Millennium Alliance, which we partner uh, with Vicki and others right here in this room, we awarded the grant, uh, grants from USAID and our partners here in India on the, on the development side to do innovative things as well. Health and development, I could go on and on, but we are doing a lot together. The final thing I would mention is that one of the signature things we are going to um, do next year with India is our Global Entrepreneurship Summit, which is the, the global effort to bring together thousands of entrepreneurs across the globe. They will come right here to India. We, we hope that the Indian side is soon ready to announce a date and a city. Uh, in which the Global Entrepreneurship Summit will be held, but we just held ours, ours in Northern California. The President was there, Secretary of State, and others were there, and it was an amazing event, and we are really excited that India is going to play host to the Global Entrepreneurship Summit. So look, uh, as I said, going forward, uh, we are committed across the spectrum. We're committed to this area of entrepreneurship and innovation. Um, there are no shortcuts here. You know, it's a lot of hard work. Good ideas still matter. Our human relationships still matter. This isn't about simply finding the latest app for your phone. This is also about people-to-people um, -people relationships, kind of building uh, kind of support for good ideas no matter where they come from. I just want you to know you have our continued support, strong support. The President's very focused on this area. Ultimately, just echoing what the President and Prime Minister said, this is about transforming people's lives in both of our countries. And I wish you well in your work ahead. Thank you very much. Well, that's a terrific message, again, for our inaugural uh, Innovation Forum program here. But we've heard from a think tank, trade association, government, uh, now it's time to actually turn the lens to innovators themselves. Uh, the largest startup in the world, I'd say, probably right now. Um, having uh, Eric Alexander here from Uber, who heads up uh, their, their Asia-Pacific uh, operations, is, is a real treat. And having uh, Uber's partnership uh, with the Innovation Forum has just been terrific. Uh, he's currently head of business for Uber in Asia-Pacific, a region including China, uh, India, Southeast Asia, Australia, and New Zealand. Uh, in this role, he's focused on driving Uber's historical growth trajectory through the formation of strategic partnerships with both private and public sector organizations, as well as critical technology investments. Over 20 years of business development experience and corporate development experience, and widely viewed as an expert on strategic deal making. And during his career, Eric has ex executed contracts uh, now valued at well over a billion dollars. So it's terrific to have uh, Eric here, terrific having a partner like Uber for the Innovation Forum. And I welcome you up to the lectern, sir. Uh, thanks, everyone. Um, thanks, Rick. Thanks, Vicki. Um, and thanks, everyone, for taking the time uh, to be here today. Um, first, I always love to ask the question, um, how many people in the room have ever taken an Uber? All right. That's good. It's a good response. How many got stuck in traffic on the way here today? <laughs> We're working on that problem. We're still trying to get there. Um, it's great to be here to participate in the U.S.-India Innovation Forum. Uh, it's a big deal for us. Uh, we really believe in uh, the entrepreneurial spirit and uh, bringing that to the cities and the countries that we operate in. Um, it's interesting because today is also Uber's third anniversary um, here in India. Um, so three years ago today, we started our operations in Bangalore. And the operation started with 14 people. Like any good startup, everything starts small, right? So it was actually we started with 14 cars um, was what we started with. Uh, you got to start somewhere when you build companies. And so it was a very small operation and a very small team of people. And we gave um, a very simple mission, which was to make uh, safe, reliable transportation uh, as available as running water and make that here in India. And it's something that uh, three years later, I'm super proud to say uh, those first 14 uh, participants and driver partners of ours is now up to over 400,000. 
Um, so we've gone from one city, and we now operate in 29 cities in India. Um, India is now our fastest growing business across the globe. It's a um, huge driver for us, and we're investing very heavily. Um, there's no secret, um, Uber's invested over a billion dollars into, into India, and we continue to do so. Um, when, when, um, when we first launched, um, it was, you know, we had, a, we had the mission of making transportation as, you know, as reliable, and, uh, as, reliable as running water. Um, but one of the other things we wanted to do was to also create as many uh, economic opportunities within the country as possible. Um, so we currently, in addition to our over 500 Uber employees in India, uh, we have a center of excellence in Hyderabad. Uh, we have an engineering center in Bangalore, and we're really proud of those. Um, so we continue to try to grow our business and grow, um, you know, help stimulate and grow the Indian economy as well. A um, couple other things we're super proud of that we've done here is, um, as you know, some of you got stuck in traffic on the way here. And we have uh, what we hope to be a very, um, a very successful implementation and solution here in India. And it's a product called Uber Pool, uh, carpooling. When you put two, three people in a car, it takes cars off the road. And we launched that product in, um, in about five cities now in India. And in just two cities in under six months, um, we've saved over 300,000 liters of fuel using our carpool product and taken about almost 800 metric tons of uh, carbon emissions out of the air. And this is something that really is important to Uber. It's something that we will always try to do uh, to make cars efficient. Um, cars are uh, a very underutilized asset and by Pairing people and putting multiple people into those cars, we can take cars off the road, get you there faster, and help make the environment a whole lot better. Um, many of you guys know, uh, obviously, India is a huge driver of the startup economy. It's the third largest uh, startup ecosystem in the world. Um, I think India nailed it long before uh, the US ever existed. Um, there was a famous philosopher, uh, Sant Kabir, I think he was a, a poet and a philosopher, uh, and he said, Kal kare so ajkar, aj kare so ab. <laughs> and that is the entrepreneurial spirit. I mean, roughly translated, if I get it right, it's do today what you would do tomorrow and do today, uh, do now what you would do today. And this is what an entrepreneur does. You hustle, right? It's another word I've learned here from our team, which is jugad. Uh, and it's something that I think um, it's super inspiring to myself, to Travis, to all of the leadership at Uber when we come to India. Um, our team hustles here. Um, they are competitive. They fight. Um, they work very, very hard. Um, and we're super proud of them. And across the globe, we have many, many, many uh, Indian employees. Obviously, this is not the only place, but um, we're really proud. And I would say that, um, you know, I, I'm the head of business for Asia. Uh, Asia recently got a little smaller for Uber um, with uh, some of the China news. Uh, so I spend a lot more time now in India, um, and I'm super excited about it. Like I said, it's one of our fastest growing um, and something that we really want to, um, you know, keep progressing. Um, earlier this year, um, Travis, our founder, Travis Kalanick, our founder, met with uh, the Honorable Prime Minister Modi. And when, when they met, um, the Prime Minister shared his vision of creating a country that was not about job seekers, but about job creators. And challenged Travis to say, what can you do to help? Um, help me build that. Um, you know, Travis is a uh, a very scrappy entrepreneur. Um, and Jugat is a word that he really does like. Um, and when, when they first met, um, you know, I think um, actually the prime minister ended up calling uh, Travis Kuber, I think at one point, or used a reference to uh, the god of wealth. Um, because Travis um, has really, really pushed and pushed us as people to grow a company. And Uber now is the largest privately held startup in the world. Um, but we owe it to other startups to help give back. So 
Travis challenged everyone. He challenged the team in India. He challenged the management team back in the US to bring, how do we bring that expertise of what we've learned and how we've built a company and bring that to India. So um, we started a program that we call Uber Exchange and we're super proud of this. We now have over 1,100 startups that have signed up for it. And the basic goal um, of the program was to bring, bring India to Silicon Valley and Silicon Valley to India and to bring the lessons that we've learned. Um, the ambassador talked about failure. Um, this is the first successful company Travis has started. Um, his other ones all failed uh, or arguably failed. And I think any good entrepreneur is going to have failures. And I think part of our job is to teach how you get through those things because every good entrepreneur faces some daunting tasks. Um, and there's a lot that we've learned. There's a lot we've done right, a lot that we've done wrong, and we need to share those and give those back to the cities and to the countries where we operate. Um, I think that, uh, that one, of the, one of the goals that Travis had was um, each of our different executives has different lessons. Um, so but like myself, uh, Emil, our chief business officer, uh, we've raised a lot of money. Uh, Uber's raised more money than any other technology startup in the history of the planet. And we've learned a lot by doing it and we've got a lot to share. And raising money is an important thing for an entrepreneur. So it's something that is part of our program that we teach other entrepreneurs how to do. Um, Travis is an engineer, he's a technologist, and one of the things that, um, that he felt was very, very important was to have our CTO um, explain challenges and how to scale systems and how to hire the right people, hire the right engineers. Um, so that's a big part of our program. Um, as part of the, the building a program like this, it's not just to um, teach but we want to see these things be very successful. So not only are there 1,100 startups that participate that will benefit from the expertise of what we've learned, um, we'll take the 10 winners. So we're gonna work and pick kind of 10 key startups that we feel have a, a great vision and a great plan, and we're gonna bring them to Silicon Valley. And they will spend time not only with Uber senior management, but we will set them up with other um, venture capitalists and we will help them all the way through the process of not just a business plan but of trying to get funded and then bring that business back here to India uh, because as a technology startup um, we don't invent everything ourselves we rely a lot on partnerships and we don't actually look at this program as something that can help us but it might uh, you never know when um, the graduate um, that goes and gets funded as part of this program goes and builds some amazing new technology that we can leverage later and work with. And that's great, but if it's not part of it, that's okay. It's part of our job to give back because somebody's done it for all of us. And um, so we're really excited to make this not only an aspirational program, but something that's super practical um, and that will actually bring real funding and real jobs uh, back to India that's created such a big uh, opportunity for us. So I want to show you guys a little video clip of kind of some of the um, uh, some of the uh, the speakers that we've had so far. There'll be a few more this year, and then we're planning on announcing the winners, I believe, sometime at the end of the year, December, January, December, um, and bringing those uh, back to the U.S. So let me share that with you guys right now. Screens, please. Rule one is an entrepreneur, never rely on the demo. <laughs> India, a mentorship program for Indian entrepreneurs. Over the course of the next 12 months, we'll host a leadership series of talks with six senior executives. We're so excited to be part of Uber Exchange. 
and this program um, in conjunction with Invest India. To be part of the startup culture in India at this point where these companies are really emerging is truly an opportunity. It is part of our cultures and values and desire to give back to the cities and society at every city that we operate in. And through this program, I and my executive colleague have a chance to share our knowledge and experience with all the next generation entrepreneur in India so that uh, they will go on and build amazing things for India in the future. The objectives of these sessions is to talk about different areas that each Indian entrepreneur faces over the course of his or her journey with their company. Be it fundraising, be it product design, engineering, or scaling a company. The session has been great and interactive. It's been great network networking with various startups and especially getting the inputs from the wonderful panel which we had. This is one of the best initiatives that uh, Uber has done in India with uh, collaborating with the government of India. I look forward to more such sessions and then um, becoming a part of this in the future as well. Every Uber exchange will have a set of 20 unique startups participating with us. The bigger goal is to have those 20 startups with us which will get free legal counseling 20 hours uh, with Khaitan and also to have those top 10 startups with us which will fly to SF uh, to meet Travis, to meet the Uber team and to meet some global investors. We are really looking forward to this and we hope to see you soon there. So, um, you know, it's, it's a diverse group of executives. You have uh, Sally Yu, who is our general counsel, and who provided a lot of thought leadership and expertise, um, uh, along with Mohit Abraham, uh, our head counsel for India, um, to a lot of these startups and gave them a lot of guidance, and we hope to do more of it. Tuan is a super interesting guy, our CTO. Tuan uh, comes from Vietnam and came over on a boat. Um, it was really interesting when Tuan went... Um, Recently, after, after this, there was a bunch of articles written about Tuan. And um, he, he is also one that wants to give back um, to, to, um, to countries um, and to young entrepreneurs. Because Tuan got the chance of a lifetime when his parents put him on a boat and he came from Vietnam. And it was really interesting. When articles came out about him, the boat captain that took him over from Vietnam, um, actually reached out and contacted him. And the boat captain was in a very overpopulated boat. Um, it was a very, very difficult journey. And that captain saved their lives when Tuan was a very young boy. And Tuan remembers that. And he actually went and met uh, and got hooked, reunited with the captain who did it because, um, you know, that that captain that brought him went through some very, very, very difficult times that created um, a lifetime of opportunity for Tuan, which he'll never forget. And it's something he's super dedicated to, um, uh, to giving back. And India is super important to him because it's been so important to Uber. And so we'll continue to do this and build a program, uh, but I couldn't be more proud of the company and the people um, and couldn't be more excited to work in India. Um, of all the places we work, like I said, the passion, the drive, the competitiveness that exists here um, keeps us going in a big way. And, you know, thanks for the opportunity to be here today and thanks for the opportunity to work in India. It's a great place and we, 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 we can't thank everyone enough. So thank you so much. Well, and I think that right there is the lesson about what we're trying to do with the U.S. India Innovation Forum. You know, Uber has taken the lead on giving back, uh, creating programs that didn't exist before. We want to find those of you in the audience, those of you that aren't here today, that are thinking about programs like that and want to learn from people like Eric and from Uber that have already tread that ground or things you could do that could actually expand or partner with the things they're doing. So this is uh, exactly indicative of the kind of things we want to trigger for the, uh, for the U.S. India Innovation Forum. Uh, so that's the opening uh, session here. Uh, we'll have a lunch. We'll condense that a little bit just so that we can uh, wrap it up on time and begin the panels post-lunch. And again, the post-lunch panels, we're going to really flesh out some of the work streams that we're going to have for the Innovation Forum for the, for the coming year on university research partnerships, on the development of ecosystems, and the role of governments in contributing to innovation. So thanks all for being here, and we'll see you on the other side of lunch. Thank you. <laughs>